Welcome to Bhakti Sangha Conference Call. Today we are fortunate to have Haragde Subhopik Radha Devi Mataji to enlighten us on the topic of Srimad Bhagavatam, 5th canto, 5th chapter, verse 24 and words. Hare Krishna Subhopik Radha Mataji, Tanvat Pranamal goes to Srila Prabhupada. Thank you very much for giving your valuable time and association to us this morning and enlightening on the topic of Srimad Bhagavatam. First, I would like to hand over call to Tiffany Mataji for brief introduction of Mataji. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Tivini Mataji, please take all the call. Hare Krishna, is it not Prabhupada? Okay. Mataji, you Tiffany Mataji. Tiffany Mataji, you have introduction? No, uh, Mataji, because today is Sunday. It's Pravin Govinda. Is he not here today? I'm so sorry. Is anybody else would like to read Mataji? Yes, Mataji, my Prabhu will be. Just give me a minute. Please, Mataji. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, please take over the call. Dandrat Pranam. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Just give me a couple of minutes. Hare Krishna Mataji. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, Dandrat Pranam, Algos to Srila Prabhupada and Gurudev. Please take over the call, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, um, Her Grace Sugopi Radha Devi Dasi. She is a disciple of His Holiness, Anumat Preshika Swami. She was born into Krishna consciousness and was mercifully nurtured by His Holiness, Gopal Krishna Goswami. His Holiness, Hanumat Preshika Swami, and His Holiness, Chandamali Swami. She was homeschooled by her parents, Srinivas Acharya Dasa and Sundari Radhika Devdas. After homeschooling, she pursued her bachelor's degree in history from Boys State University on the instruction of her spiritual master. Currently, she is pursuing her master's degree in Asian religious studies at the prestigious Yale University at New Haven, Connecticut. During her bachelor's studies, she was the president of Gaura Rasa Club that conducted kirtans and seminars based on Srila Prabhupada's teachings. She also writes on Hinduism for the weekly devotion of Yale um, Divinity, Divinity School. Having been personally taught Bhakti Shastri course by His Holiness, His Holiness Hanumat Preshaka Swami, she shares her academic and spiritual perspectives on the scriptures, both in the university and devotee communities. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Prabhuji, for reading the introduction of Mataji. Now I would like to hand over the call to you, Mataji. Please accept the call. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Radha Mataji, and also Prabhu for the kind introduction. I would are you all able to hear me okay? Yes, Mataji, we can able to hear Mataji. Thank you, Mataji. So I'll just start with a short Jaya Radha Madhava Kirtan and then we'll move on to the class. Yeah. 
express my special gratitude to Shamagori Mataji for giving me this opportunity for service. Thank you, Mataji. So I'll share my screen now, and then we can get started. Radha Mataji, are you able to see my screen? Yes, Mataji, we can able to see you. Okay, Mataji. So we'll start with some prayers. Narayanam namaskritya naram chaiva narottamam devim sarasvatim yasam tato jaya mudirayet nashta prayeshva bhadreshu nityam bhagavata sevaya bhagavat yuttama shloke bhaktir bhavati naishtiki. So today we're discussing the chapter where Lord Rishabhadev instructs his 100 sons. So can anyone on the call tell me why was Lord Rishabhadev instructing his sons? What was the purpose for that? Any ideas? Go ahead. To follow their son, Bharat Maharaj. Yes, Mataji, that was, that was a part of the instructions for sure. But like, what, what was the purpose for him instructing his sons? Uh, to behave all his uh, hundred sons like, like him, um, to follow all the principles, what, however he's doing. Yes, Prabhuji, that's also one reason. Three verses after this, Shukadev Goswami explains why Rishabhadev was instructing his sons. He says that although the sons of Rishabhadev were perfectly educated and cultured, he instructed them just to set an example of how a father should instruct his sons before retiring from family life. So these children were already perfectly educated and cultured, being brought up in the household of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. They knew everything that they were supposed to know. But Lord Rishabhadev instructed them because he had to set an example. And what is the importance of setting an example? Why is it important that we set an example? Krishna explains this in the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 3, verse 21. I'm sure all of you are familiar with this. Yadyada charati shreshta stata deveta rojana sayat pramanam kurute lokastad anuvartate. Whatever great men do, lokastad anuvartate. That's what the common men follow. The whole world follows whatever great men do. So the full translation is, whatever action a great man performs, common men follow. And whatever standard he sets by exemplary acts, all the world pursues. So who is the great man that this verse is referring to? 
Srila Prabhupada emphasizes in the purport for this verse that there are three leaders who are especially important, who the whole world follows. And those three leaders are the king or executive head of the state, the father, and the school teacher. So these three people have a very, very grave responsibility. Through their own lives, they shape, form, and transform the trajectory of the world. So they can control how the world moves and what direction it takes based on their own behavior and their own activities. So not just their own family members, their close friends, or even members of their nations, but the whole world follows these great leaders. So now we can understand how important it was for Rishabhadev to set an example, because, because he was both an illustrious king, which is one of the leaders that Prabhupada emphasized, and also a father. So he, when he instructed his sons, he didn't exactly do it to help them gain abilities. Usually when we teach our children or other people, we teach for ability. We teach them the ability to tolerate, the ability to be kind, the ability to chant and so on. But Lord Rishabhadev was not educating his sons for ability. He was doing it through responsibility. He was doing it through his responsibility to the whole world. And being the Supreme Lord, his example is taken even more seriously than any leader in the world. Like we have leaders like Mahatma Gandhi or Martin Luther King Jr. We look up to them, but slowly as the course of history progresses, their fame will also diminish and they'll disappear from the public consciousness. But being the Supreme Lord, Rishabhadev's glories will be studied for eternity, for yugas and yugas to come. So people will pay attention to what he did, how he conducted himself, how he taught his children. That's why he set an example through this responsibility of being a leader. And this example is not just for people who are around him. It's for all of us, all the people who are going to exist in history to come. In the 15th verse of this chapter, which is a few verses before today's, Rishabhadev says, if anyone is instructing someone else, whether it be a father to his sons, a spiritual master to his disciples, or a king to his citizens, he must instruct them as I have advised. So Rishabhadev is setting an example, as we can see, for everyone who has to instruct their subordinates on the principles of religion. So now that we understood the purpose for which Maharaj Rishabhadev instructed his sons, we'll be able to better appreciate what the instructions are. The instructions that Rishabhadev mercifully awarded his children are quite all-encompassing or comprehensive. They include the importance of detaching ourselves from sense gratification. They give us a perspective on how to view the Lord's body. They teach us how to view the different energies of the Lord. But most importantly, they illustrate how dear the brahmanas are to Krishna. So especially verses 23 and 24 demonstrate how Lord is brahmanahita. Brahmanahita means the benefactor and well-wisher of the Brahmanas. So what does Brahmanahita mean? Does anyone want to explain this? Hare Krishna Mataji. Hare Krishna. Hita means well-wisher. So Brahmanahita means well-wisher of Brahmanas. Yes, Prabhu, very nice, exactly. That's what it means. And we probably hear this name a lot because it's in a prayer from the Vishnu Purana that we always recite when we offer a bhoga to the Lord, which is Namo Brahmanya Devaya Go Brahmana Hitaya Cha Jagad Hitaya Krishnaya Govindaya Namo Namaha. So here Krishna is especially glorified as Go Brahmana Hitaya Cha. So one who is the well-wisher of the cows and the brahmanas. So today's verse will show even further how much the brahmanas mean to the Lord. So we'll move on to the verse. Hare Krishna, Mataji, we are not able to see your screen, Mataji. Okay, Mataji. I can, actually. Can see the screen. I can see it too, Mataji. Okay. Um, 
Are you able to see the verse now, Mataji? Yes, Mataji. Now we okay. can even see it. Okay, Mataji. So I'll recite this verse. Dhrita tanurushati me purani ene hasatvam paramam pavitram shamodama satyam anugrahascha tapasti tikshanu bhavascha yatra Dhrita tanurushati me purani ene hasatvam paramam pavitram shamodama satyam anugrahascha tapasti Tapasti tikshanu bhavascha yatra. Dhrita tanuru shati me purani. Yene hasatvam paramam pavitram. Shamodama satyam anugrahascha. Tapasti tikshanu bhavascha yatra. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. The Vedas are my eternal transcendental sound incarnation. Therefore, the Vedas are Shabda Brahma. In this world, the Brahmanas thoroughly study all the Vedas, and because they assimilate the Vedic conclusions, they are also to be considered the Vedas personified. The Brahmanas are situated in the supreme transcendental mode of nature, Sattvaguna. Because of this, they are fixed in mind control, shama, sense control, dhamma, and truthfulness, satya. They describe the Vedas in their original sense and out of mercy, anugraha, they preach the purpose of the Vedas to all conditioned souls. They practice penance, tapasya, and tolerance, titiksha, and they realize the position of the living entity and the Supreme Lord, anubhava. These are the eight qualifications of the Brahmanas. Therefore, among all living entities, no one is superior to the Brahmanas. Purport, this is a true description of a Brahmana. A Brahmana is one who has assimilated the Vedic conclusions by practicing mind and sense control. He speaks the true version of all the Vedas. As confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita 1515, Vedaishya Sarvair Ahameva Vedyaha. By studying all the Vedas, one should come to understand the transcendental position of Lord Sri Krishna. One who actually assimilated the essence of the Vedas can preach the truth. He is compassionate to conditioned souls who are suffering the threefold miseries of this conditional world due to their not being Krishna conscious. A Brahmana should take pity on the people and preach Krishna consciousness in order to elevate them. Sri Krishna himself, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, personally descends into this universe from the spiritual kingdom to teach conditioned souls about the values of spiritual life. He tries to induce them to surrender unto him. Similarly, the Brahmanas do the same thing. After assimilating the Vedic instructions, they assist the Supreme Lord in his endeavor to deliver conditioned souls. The Brahmanas are very dear to the Supreme Lord due to their high sattva guna qualities, and they also engage in welfare activities for all conditioned souls in the material world. Om Ajnana Timirandhasya Ajnana Anjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Mukam Karoti Vachalam Pangum Langayate Girim Yat Kripata Maham Bande Shri Gurum Dina Taranam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishthaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswate Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Pashtatya Deshatarine Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gaurabhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 
कृष्ण कृष्ण हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे so as we start our discussion let's first discuss who a brahmana is what does it mean to be a brahmana so by modern standards of definition a brahmana is someone who has been born into a brahmana lineage someone who belongs to a brahmin caste but the authoritative shastras give us a radically different definition what is the definition that the shastras give us brahma janati iti brahmana one who knows brahma is a brahmana so when we hear the word brahma usually we think of lord brahma but that's not the meaning here brahma here means the vedas even in the first verse of shrimad bhagavatam the word brahma is used in the sense of the vedas so we often often hear this verse janma dyasya yaton vayaditarata shartheshva bhignya swarat tene brahma hridaya adikavaye mohyanti atsuraya tene brahma hridaya adikavaye so this is explaining how brahma lord brahma who is called adikavi received the vedas through his heart which is brahma here means the vedas so that's how lord brahma originally received knowledge through his heart so even in the shrimad bhagavatam the word brahma is used in the sense of the vedas so brahma janati ti brahmana someone who knows brahma the vedas is a brahmana so it doesn't say anything about caste or birth there so while brahma means the vedas and one who knows the vedas is a brahmana how do we recognize a brahmana in this age because the vedas are such a big corpus of literature that most people don't have access to that's the first thing the second thing is that it's written in very complex sanskrit so even people who have access to it have a hard time understanding really what it says so how do we recognize a brahmana because a brahmana is someone who knows the vedas as sri la propad cites in the purport krishna strongly asserts in the bhagavad gita sarvasya chaham hridi sannivishto matta smritir gnanam apohanam cha vedaishta sarvairaham eva vedyo vedanta krit veda videva chaham vedaishta sarvair aham eva vedyo of all the vedas i am to be known the ultimate goal of the vedas is to know krishna so if someone knows krishna that means that they know the vedas and if they know the vedas it means that they're a brahmana so we may ask what is the essence of all the vedas especially since we're very short lived so even if we have access to the vedas even if we know how to read sanskrit it's not humanly possible to read all the vedas and understand them in one lifetime so the essence of all the vedas is the shrimad bhagavatam and this is declared by suta goswami as he's praising shukadev goswami before starting to speak the shrimad bhagavatam he says yasvanu bhavam akila shruti sarame kam adhyatma deepam atititir shitam tamondham samsarinam karunaya purana guhyam tam vyasa sunu mupayami gurum muninam here suta goswami calls shrimad bhagavatam akila shruti saram ekam akila means everything and shruti refers to the vedas whenever we see the word shruti that means the vedic literature and when we see smriti that means like the puranas or the bhagavad gita the shrimad bhagavatam etc so shruti saram means the cream of all vedic knowledge sara is like the essence or the cream So the cream of all Vedic knowledge is the Shrimad Bhagavatam and that's its most important essence. The Shrimad Bhagavatam is like a lamp in this verse, a lamp that we can use to cross over the ignorance of material existence. Thus through logic given all of these points we can say that anyone who carefully studies and understands the Shrimad Bhagavatam which is Shruti Sara and which glorifies Krishna extensively is a brahmana. 
So now we understood that a Brahmana is someone who knows Krishna, and we can know Krishna by studying the Srimad Bhagavatam. Now we can delve into the qualities of a Brahmana that Lord Rishabhadev discusses in this verse. The first quality that he mentions is that the Brahmanas assimilate everything in the Vedas. He says that the Brahmanas thoroughly study all the Vedas, and because they assimilate the Vedic conclusions, they are also to be considered the Vedas personified. So the Brahmanas are the living Vedas, the walking Vedas. Why? Because they assimilated the conclusions of the Vedas. The word assimilate is a very important one in this context. It means to fully absorb something, to become completely immersed in it. Just like a sponge may absorb, absorb all the water that you pour in it, the brahmanas absorb everything that they learn from the Vedas. And they take those instructions to heart. And once they take them to heart, they manifest them in their outward behavior. They first take the instructions in and then manifest them in the outward behavior. So then they live in exact harmony with the principles of the Vedas, which then means that they're basically as good as the Vedas because their life teaches us the same thing that the Vedas may teach us. So that's why they're the Vedas personified, if they assimilate the knowledge. So an excellent example of a Brahmana who assimilated the Vedic knowledge is Shukadeva Goswami, the speaker of the Srimad Bhagavatam. In the verse I just cited a few minutes ago, Yesvanu Bhava Makila Shruti Sarameikam, the word Svanu Bhavam is very significant. Svanu Bhava means self assimilated or experienced. In other words, Shukadev Goswami is being praised for speaking the Srimad Bhagavatam after realizing it himself. So he heard the Srimad Bhagavatam when he was in the womb of his mother from his father Vyasadev. And then he assimilated that knowledge and he converted from an impersonalist to a devotee of the Lord. Shukadev Goswami was formerly an, formerly an impersonalist, but by hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam, he, become, he became convinced of the glory of Krishna, of the supremacy of Krishna, of the beauty of Krishna's personal form. And therefore he converted from an infer, impersonalist to a devotee. And similarly, Shukadev Goswami's disciple, Sutta Goswami, is also a wonderful example of a Brahmana who assimilated the Vedas. When Shukadev Goswami narrated the Srimad Bhagavatam for seven days and seven nights, we know that Parikshit Maharaj was not the only disciple present there. As you can see in this picture, there were many, many sages and important personalities who had come to listen to the Bhagavatam. You can even see Narada Muni sitting there with his Veena. And one of the students there was a person named Sutta. Sutta was from a family of chariot drivers. He did not belong to a caste that was high in the caste hierarchy. Nevertheless, he listened to the Srimad Bhagavatam very carefully. And then he instructed the sages of Naimisharanya on the same topics that Shukadev Goswami instructed Maharaj Parikshitan. And when he met the sages of Naimisharanya, when Sutta Goswami met those sages, he recited this verse. Tatra kirta yato vipra vipra shir bhuri tejasaha aham chadyagamam tatra nivishtas tadanugrahat soham vashrava yishyami yathaditam yathamati. O learned Brahmanas, when Shukadev Goswami recited the Bhagavatam there in the presence of Emperor Parikshit, I heard him with rapt attention. And thus, by his mercy, I learned the Srimad Bhagavatam from that very great and powerful sage. Now, I shall try to make you hear the very same thing as I learned it from him and as I have realized it. So as I have realized it is the important part in this verse. Yathadhitam yathamati. So I will explain whatever I've learned as I realized it or as I assimilated it. This is a very important point that a true Brahmana, he first tries to understand the subject matter and live according to the principles of the subject matter before instructing others on that. Because if he instructs others without assimilating it himself, 
that amounts to hypocrisy. Hypocrisy means to not practice what you preach. So a true Brahmana like Shukadev Goswami or Sutta Goswami really assimilates first the knowledge of the Vedas or the knowledge of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And then they share that knowledge with others. The next quality that Rishabhadev talks about is sattva, the mode of goodness, and then the resultant mind and sense control that come from the mode of goodness. So he says sattvam paramam pavitram in the verse that we read today. It's important to note that the sattva here is referring to vishuddha sattva or pure goodness. It's not the mode of goodness that we talk about when we understand the three modes of material nature. It's not that mode of goodness. This mode of pure goodness is for people who are under the shelter of the Daivi Prakriti or the superior energy of the Lord. So Srila Prabhupada comments in his lectures often that being in Vishuddha Sattva means operating in a transformed state of consciousness. So we may still be in this material world, but our consciousness is different if we're in Vishuddha Sattva. To be in Krishna consciousness 24 hours a day is to be in Vishuddha Sattva. So what does it mean to be in Krishna consciousness 24 hours a day? Everything around us is so material. So how can we remember Krishna 24 hours a day? Krishna helps us with this too in the Bhagavad Gita when he discusses his vibhutis. He explains that he's the taste in water. So if a devotee in Vishuddha Sattva would understand whenever he drinks water, that Krishna is the taste in water. And when he sees the sun, he would think that Krishna's eye is the sun. And if he sees an athletic champion or a strong person, he would think that Krishna says, I'm the ability in man. So through this athletic champion, I can see the glory of Krishna. So when someone is in Vishuddha Sattva, all they can see is Krishna. They can't see anything else because this is all Krishna's creation and every part of it shows how glorious he is. And another name for Vishuddha Sattva is called Vasudeva Sattva. Sattvam Vishuddham Vasudeva Shabditam. So Vasudeva is a name of Krishna that means all pervading. So a devotee who sees and feels Vasudeva at all times and places is in the pure state of transcendental goodness. So through this understanding of Vishuddha Sattva, which Rishabhadeva advocates for as a quality of the Brahmanas, we can see that the Brahmanas are in Krishna consciousness all the time. And because they're in Krishna consciousness all the time, they can naturally control their mind and senses. In the Bhagavad Gita in chapter 2, verse 59, Krishna says, Vishaya vini vartante nirahara dehinaha rasa varjam rasopyasya param drishtva nivartate. Though an embodied soul may be restricted from sense enjoyment, the taste for sense objects remains. But seizing such engagements by experiencing a higher taste, he is fixed in consciousness. So when the devotee experiences the higher taste, which is the pleasure that he gets from remembering Krishna all the time, he's no longer bothered by his senses, by their impulses, by their agitations. He doesn't care about that anymore because he, he has experienced something that's even more sublime than sensual pleasures in this world. And therefore, he's fixed in consciousness, as this verse states. He's fixed in that state of Vishuddha Sattva because he has experienced a higher taste He's no longer bothered by the agitations of this material world. The next quality that Rishabhadev discusses is satya or truthfulness. So what does it mean to be truthful? We know that the brahmanas are committed to speaking the truth all the time, but what does it mean to be truthful? This principle of truthfulness relates to what we talked about earlier about assimilation. It means also to practice what you preach to follow what you tell others to follow. That's being truthful. Also, another meaning that Prabhupada gives for truthfulness is not to misinterpret the Vedas. Some of the passages of the Vedas are very difficult to understand, but the Brahmana learns how to understand those passages from a bona fide spiritual master. 
He doesn't take advantage of the ambiguity in those passages to fulfill his own personal interests or to fulfill his personal agendas, selfish agendas or selfish ambitions. Instead, he sincerely receives revelation from his spiritual masters. So even when there's a possibility of manipulating the scriptures to do something for his own gain, the Brahmana chooses not to do that. He chooses to be honest. An excellent example of truthfulness in a Brahmana is the sage called Javala. Formerly, he was a son of a prostitute. And when he was small, he went to the sage Gautama Muni's ashram. So usually only people from the Brahmana caste would study at sages ashrams. But he was inquisitive. He wanted to know the truth and he wanted to think through the difficult questions of life. So he went to the sage Gautama and he said, can I please become your disciple? And Gautama said, uh, whose son are you? And he said, I don't know, I need to ask my mom. So he went back to his mother and he said, mother, whose son am I? And because the mother was a prostitute, she didn't know whose son he was. And she said, I, to tell you the truth, I don't know whose son you are. I don't know who, who's your father. So even though this was something that was embarrassing in society, Jabala decided not to hide the truth from Gautama Muni. Since Gautama Muni asked, who's your father? He decided to tell him the truth. So he went to Gautama Muni and he said, Gautama Muni, my father, I don't know who my father is. And Gautama Muni was so impressed by that honesty that he took this Jabala as his disciple. The honesty is what mattered to him more, not how great he was or how many accomplishments he had. That's not what touched the spiritual master. What touched the spiritual master is the sincerity and the honesty of the prospective disciple. Because once we have sincerity and honesty, we can progress to very great heights. But if we try to manipulate, we won't end up going anywhere. We won't progress in spiritual life no matter what high parentage we're from or what qualifications we have due to birth, those don't matter if we don't have honesty and sincerity. So like this sage Jabala, all brahmanas, true brahmanas are committed to speaking the truth, no matter how hard it may be, they're committed to speaking the truth because at the end of the day, that's what's the most beneficial for both themselves and for the whole human society to uphold the brahminical culture. The next quality is Marsi or Anugraha. This is what Srila Prabhupada decides to focus on in his purport to this verse. Prabhupada's purports are so special because through them we can get a glimpse of what Prabhupada is thinking and what goes on in his mind. Because we can see that out of so many qualities, what he considers especially important for us to learn. So when he says that a Brahmana should take pity on those who are not Krishna conscious or should be compassionate towards those who are not who are suffering in this material world, he's referring to the word anugraha that Rishabhadev states in this verse. After all, a devotee is called paradukaduki or someone who feels sadness by seeing someone else's sadness. Someone else's distress is my own distress. That's how a devotee thinks. And that's why when he sees the suffering souls in the material world who are hankering after things that will never make them happy, and they think that it will make them happy, but they keep getting frustrated again and again and again. So the dev devotee feels so much compassion for them. The devotee has attained the stage of Vishuddha Sattva, which means that they're always peaceful and happy. They have nothing to worry about, and they have nothing to be sad about but they're sad because others are sad. Even though they've attained perfection, they're sad because others are still suffering in this material world. Srila Prabhupada is a prime example for this phrase, para dukhi. He was perfectly situated in Vrindavan and he was peacefully doing his writing work. He was translating. He was in the Radha Damodar temple. Vrindavan is such a pleasant atmosphere. You always hear bells ringing. People are chanting the holy name even to greet each other. But now, obviously, the Radhe Radhe is being replaced by honks on motorcycles and autos. But before 
more so before than now, people used to greet each other saying Radhe Radhe. The rickshaw person was asking someone in front of him to move, he would say Radhe Radhe. So the whole environment in Vrindavan was so conducive for Krishna consciousness, so pleasant and so blissful. But Prabhupada chose to leave Vrindavan. He chose to leave Vrindavan because of his compassion for the conditioned souls. And he was feeling so much for them that every day at night he would sweep Rupa Goswami Samadhi and cry and pray to Rupa Goswami that please empower me so I can go and help these people. I really want to help them because they're suffering so much. Before almost everyone had failed in their attempts to preach in the Western world. So Prabhupada was taking up a very enormous challenge. But his compassion motivated him to do it, no matter how many obstacles there seemed to be. Like he was 70 years old. He didn't have much money because he was a sannyasi, but he decided that somehow I want to go and help these people. So he got on the ship Jaladuta due to the kindness of Sumati Muraji. He got onto this cargo ship and for months he sat on that cargo ship all because of his compassion for the conditioned souls. And once, once he reached Boston, he wrote this beautiful song, which is called Boro Kripa Koile Krishna, with his own progress and who continues with his own devotional service and he doesn't care about other people. It's quite the opposite. The Brahmana's whole life is about helping other people, giving them knowledge so that they can also come closer to Krishna. Another example of mercy is Abhiram Thakur. Today is his disappearance day. He is Sri Dhamma and Krishna Leela, and he is said to be empowered by Lord Nityananda, who had a lot of compassion for the fallen conditioned souls. So because he was empowered by Lord Nityananda, Abhiram Thakur was also very compassionate to all the fallen conditioned souls. He was always absorbed in Sakya Rasa, which is like the friendly mood because Sri Dhamma is Krishna's friend in Krishna Lila. Even in Gaura Lila, he was absorbed in the Sakya Rasa and he made a flute out of a bamboo stick that he would carry around. And I also heard that he had a stick and then he would touch, he would touch devotees with that stick and they would become ecstatic after that. So he's a very interesting personality and he's also an example for this anugraha or compassion. The next quality that Rishabhadev discusses is tapasya and titiksha. Tapasya means austerity and titiksha means tolerance. So these two are very important qualities that a brahmana has as well. So tapasya and titiksha come as a natural consequence of anugraha. So when the brahmana has compassion for the suffering conditioned souls, he has to undergo austerity and he has to exercise a lot of tolerance as he brings people out of the ocean of material existence. Because we've been in this material world for who knows how many lifetimes. So we're being covered more and more and more. Our hearts and our minds are being covered more and more with dust. So we're forgetting how to behave like nice devotees, like servants of Krishna. So the devotee, the brahmana has to remind us of all of those things and slowly help us learn again. Like some people, they have very um, serious events happen in their lives or something where their brain gets triggered or they have a brain stroke. And then they forget many things like how to eat or how to walk. And then slowly the people around them, they have to teach them those things again. So similarly, we've been divorced from Krishna's spiritual world for so long that we need reminders and we need slow nurturing to come back to our <clears throat> constitutional position. So while the Brahmana is helping us do this, he has to take on a lot of austerity and he has to be very tolerant with us because we have so many faults, but slowly he teaches us to overcome those faults overcome the shortcomings and become brahmanas like him. So Srila Prabhupada is continuing with his example. He went through so much austerity to give Krishna consciousness to the Western people and all over the world, even to the Indians, to the Africans, to everyone he wanted to give Krishna consciousness. So he went through so much austerity. 
he was imagine he was 70 years old nowadays when people are 70 or most of the time they think that this is the time to retire this is the time that I want to do what I like to do. I want to go travel for pleasure. I want to watch TV. I want to just spend time with my friends. But Prabhupada didn't do that. After a whole life of working hard in a pharmacy and raising so many children, all with the motivation of, of gaining money so that he can help his guru, he finally took sannyas and he didn't even take a break then. He, at 70 years old, he had to figure out a whole new culture. And at 70 years old, he went through three heart attacks in the Jaladuta when he was coming to America. He was all alone. He had hardly any support from his god brothers or from anyone else in America. He, he just knew Gopal Agarwal. And even they, they didn't exactly know how to treat him. He was just in the couch. He was sleeping on their couch. And I think there was meat in their house, but somehow he he worked around all of those things. So it's so much austerity for a pure devotee like Prabhupada, who comes from the spiritual world to operate at a place where all the four regulative principles are broken. People drink in America, they gamble, they eat meat, and they're not chaste. So Prabhupada was operating in this environment, plus he didn't have much money. It was not like he could get all the necessities and all the facilities that he deserved for spreading this movement. He was a sannyasi and he only came with 40 rupees. So he would walk for miles just to get something like oil to cook with. So that was such a big struggle. And on top of that, he was trying to do this writing work. He was trying to write the Bhaktivedanta purports so that he could give them to all the people in America and he could transmit the message of Lord Chaitanya. But his typewriter and his tape recorder, which were two very important things to writing these books, they're very important tools. They're what Srila Prabhupada used to write his books. Even those were stolen when he was in New York. So his only possessions for spreading Lord Chaitanya's movement, even those were stolen. So how much austerity he had to go through. And I have this picture here because you can see that there's snow and snow is something very abnormal in India. Most parents and grandparents, they say, if you want us to come to America, we'll come in the summer, but don't ask us to come in the winter because we can't survive the snow. But Srila Prabhupada, even though he was from India, the climate is so different in India and it's warm there. He went through every austerity, including adjusting to freezing weather in the snow to because of his mercy to give Krishna consciousness to all the conditioned souls. So even he tolerated his disciples after he he went through the austerity to make them devotees. He tolerated them even still, and he tolerates all of us even today because we have so many shortcomings. And his disciples, many of them, many of them are very sincere and they continue to serve the movement and only because of them, we're all here today because of their strength. But some of them also continue to exhibit their old tendencies after they, became devotees, like Prabhupada initiated several sannyasis who then decided to accept the Grihastha Ashram or to leave the movement completely and marry again. So Prabhupada had to tolerate all of these deviations, but still he was not adverse to those people who are not able to keep up the standard of either being a devotee or a sannyasi. He still found a way to somehow engage them because he was so merciful. He didn't discard them. He didn't reject them. He always found a way that they could continue to have a place in Lord Chaitanya's mission and go closer towards Krishna. The last quality that Rishabhadev discusses of a Brahmana is Anubhava, which means to know the position of the living entity and the Supreme Lord. So this is a very important quality of the Brahmanas, and it is the quality through which 
They can be unbiased and they can be equally merciful to everyone, no matter what their background, their body or anything. As you can see in this picture, this Brahmana sees the super soul in everyone's heart, in the dog, the dog eater, the elephant, the cow, in the Brahmana. He sees everyone as parts and parcels of the Supreme Lord. So this is what Anubhava means. It means to know that the living entities are parts and parcels of the Supreme Lord. They're all parts of him. So in this way, we can see everyone equally because then we see the Lord in their heart and then we naturally get respect for them because their body is a temple of the Lord. They're eternal servants of the Lord. So they're very respectable people, no matter who it is, whether it's an animal or a human being, Everyone deserves our respect because they're Krishna's servants. So this concludes all the qualities that Rishabhadev discussed in the, in the verse for today. I would just like to say, bring to attention what a great opportunity we have to become Brahmanas because of the mercy of Srila Prabhupada. He was faced with severe opposition when he was first starting this movement now almost 55 years ago, from people in India or from caste Brahmins who espoused the definition that we discussed earlier, that a Brahmana is someone who is born into a Brahman family. So an Amer a American cannot become a Brahmana. Someone who's from a lower caste can't become a Brahmana. That's what they thought. But Prabhupada strongly fought against that. He said that Krishna delineated the Varnashrama system based on guna and karma. So it was not based on janma. It was not based on birth. The qualities are the most important. So Prabhupada gave us every opportunity to become brahmanas and to attain the perfection of life. He gave us all facilities to understand Srimad Bhagavatam, which is the essence of the Vedas. And he translated that into English. It's such a big, big... Um, it's such a big contribution that we need to recognize because not everyone knows Sanskrit and Prabhupada's translating the Srimad Bhagavatam, going through so much effort, waking up late at night after full days of programs at such an old age to translate the Srimad Bhagavatam and give us the purport is very important because many, many people now have access to the Vedas, to the essence of the Vedas. So he gave us the Srimad Bhagavatam and also his kind disciples who are also merciful to the conditioned souls. They translated the Srimad Bhagavatam into over 60 languages. So the public who can read it has increased even more after Prabhupada's translation and the translation of his devotees to different languages. So since we have all the facilities through ISKCON and Srila Prabhupada's purports to become brahmanas. I hope that we all can become perfect brahmanas like Lord Rishabhadev explained. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Does anyone have any comments or questions? Hare Krishna Mataji. Thank you so much Mataji. What a beautiful class Mataji. You have so sweet voice. You sang beautiful song. I felt like temple is here Mataji and very nice presentation. I have one question Mataji. Brahmana means who knows the Vedas and share the knowledge, truthfulness, who prays to Lord Krishna. Even though some people, they came from Brahmana family, they misuse their Brahmana life like they, they will drink and eat non -veg. So then how can respect to them, Mataji? Okay, Mataji. So you're asking, like, since I said everyone deserves respect, because they have the Paramatma in them. But some people who are from Brahmana families, they don't behave like true Brahmana. So how do we respect them? That's the question. Yes, Mataji. Okay, Mataji. So in, Ru in the Nectar of Instruction, Rupa Goswami teaches us how we need to deal with different kinds of people. So a Madhya Madhikari deals with different kinds of people differently. It doesn't mean that we disrespect anyone but we deal with them differently. So there's like the Kanishta Adhikari, the Madhyama Adhikari, and the Uttama Adhikari. The Kanishta Adhikari is a person who only believes in Krishna, only believes in God, 
and they they only see their relationship with the deity. They don't respect other devotees around them. They don't really they don't follow Vaishnava etiquette so much. So the Madhyama Adhikari, he he tries to slowly teach those kinds of people through mercy, like like the Brahmana usually does. He teaches those people through mercy. And then with equals, with his friends, he he develops friendship with equal devotees. So he shares the six exchanges that Rupa Goswami discusses, Dadati Pratigrahnati Gohyamakyati Prachati, giving and receiving gifts, sharing confidential thoughts with them and talking to them in confidence, sharing prasadam, etc. So with equal devotees, he does that. He respects the Supreme Lord with a lot of veneration. And then for advanced devotees, he always seeks to be their servant and take their association. So I would say, and then if someone is envious of Krishna consciousness or of devotees, then he respectfully avoids them. He doesn't get into conflicts with them and get into, if he can't really change their hearts because they're so envious, he avoids them for the time being. So it depends on, like you said, some brahmanas, they they do all kinds of bad things like drinking and eating meat. So I think it would come to making the distinction of whether they're envious or whether they're innocently doing it in the sense that they don't have the proper direction or they don't have the proper shiksha gurus to put them on the right track. So if they're innocent in that way, then we can show our mercy because in this age of Kali, Kalo Shudra Sambhavaha, everyone is born a Shudra. And there are so many misleading, inform so much misleading information that's all over the place, so many false gurus. So it's very reasonable that some Brahmanas may just get confused. They may think that the Western, the West is the best. So I should just do whatever people in the West do. They may think that. So they may be innocent. And if they're innocent, we can respect them. And at the same time, show mercy to them and gradually elevate them to the platform of a Brahmana. But if they're knowingly doing this, and if they're not accepting our advice, even though we're gently trying to help them, and if they're envious of us, then if we're Madhyama Adhikaris, we'll just have to stay away from them. If we're Uttama Adhikaris, then we'll know how to transform their hearts like Srila Prabhupada transformed so many envious people's hearts. But if we're Madhya Madhikaris, then we just need to avoid them. So that's what I would say, Mataji, depending on whether they're envious or innocent, we can deal with them in that way. Thank you so much, Mataji. Beautiful Thank answer. You. I would like to, I would request my dear devotees, if anybody have any questions or realization, please go ahead. Or please raise your hand so we can unmute for you. Hare Krishna, Sukopi Radha Mataji. Thank you so much for such a beautiful presentation. I just want to first apologize for not having your introduction ready this morning. No problem, Mataji. Thank you. But I also just want to say thank you so much for illustrating so beautifully all of the qualities of a Brahmana and how... Uh, Srila Prabhupada was such a beautiful and precious example of all of those qualities and inspiring. I know for me, inspiring me to try to live up to those qualities and be a good example of a devotee and follow um, everything that Srila Prabhupada has given us. Thank you so very much for your beautiful presentation, Mataji. So inspiring. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Mataji. You're, as you were explaining how much you admire Srila Prabhupada, I was feeling inspired as well. I hope that I can feel for Srila Prabhupada as you do one day. Thank you. Amrita Gaurangi Mataji, you can go ahead, Mataji. Mataji, Dandavat Pranams, Mataji, really um, inspiring class, a very nice uh, presentation. And it was very, very inspiring. I have a question about a point that you mentioned, Mataji. You said uh, uh, Abhiram Thakur's uh, disappearance day today, and then you mentioned that how he was empowered by Nityananda Prabhu uh, to, be to be merciful upon others, correct? So I was wondering, how, can, how does that empowerment work? And for people like us, 
uh, how does uh, that empowerment come? Of course, uh, our service to Guru proportionately empowers us. Uh, but how do we understand that, Mataji? Thank you, Mataji, for your question. It's a very good question. First, I must say that I was looking for information on Abhiram Thakur um, in Srila Prabhupada's talks and in his books. I couldn't find much more than what I spoke of. So it was stated that he was empowered by Lord Nityananda, but I don't know specifically in his case how Lord Nityananda empowered him. But to your other question of how we can receive empowerment, I think there are multiple ways. Krishna's mercy can take so many forms. Like I think one of the biggest ways that we should we can get empowerment is by chanting the holy names very sincerely every day because that's our time with Krishna privately. That's our private conversation with Krishna. And Krishna is listening when we pray. So when we pray, then he will empower us when we chant the holy name. Also by reading Srila Prabhupada's books, because Srila Prabhupada's books are magical in the sense that many devotees say that when they're facing some difficulties and they just open a random page of Srila Prabhupada's books, then they gain empowerment from that. They gain strength, they gain direction and light on how to move forward in their lives. So these are the two, two methods of empowerment that I can think of. But Krishna's mercy can come through the most unexpected means or Krishna's instructions and empowerment can come through the most unexpected means. Even for Srila Prabhupada, first he was focusing on the Back to Godhead magazine in Delhi and he was distributing that. And one random person told him, Swamiji, why, why are you giving magazines? Because people will just throw these away eventually. Why don't you write books? So Prabhupada took that as Krishna's empowerment through this random person. So the, the via media through which Krishna's mercy comes is the most unexpected. We don't know. So Prabhupada took this advice from this normal person who told him, why don't you write books? And he wrote so many volumes of books for our benefit. So that's what I would say, Mataji, chanting and reading Prabhupada's books, but also expecting or being ready for Krishna's mercy wherever he wants to show it to us. Thank you so much, Mataji. Most of the times, any questions we have, I have simple answers. However, we try to complicate things and uh, look for more, uh, some other answers. But as you mentioned, yes, attentive chanting and dealing with Prabhupada's books. Uh, should help us. I have another question if it's okay to ask. Uh, can I ask moderators or? Yeah. Okay, all right, thank you. So the next question I have is about this Varnashrama um, uh, classification that Krishna gives in Bhagavad Gita that it's not based on uh, your uh, Janma, but it's based on your Karma. But from uh, uh, scriptures only, we have seen examples wherein uh, in Kurukshetra war itself, when Arjuna was literally crying that he will not engage in the war, Krishna encourages him saying that you are born as a Kshatriya and therefore it's your dharma to perform, uh, to, to, to uh, fight this war. And then we also see the example of Parashram where he rejects uh, uh, Karna once he realizes that he's not born to a Kshatriya family. So how, how to correlate these two, Mataji? Because though we understand that Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita that he created the Varnashrama not based on one's uh, birth into one family. But in, in scriptures also, we see that examples of where a person is treated based on which family he was born into. So can you please explain, Mataji? Yes, Mataji. Thank you for the question. I think the first thing that comes to mind for me is a difference in yuga. So when Krishna was telling Arjuna, that because you're a Kshatriya, because you were born into this family, you're a descendant of Bharat Maharaj, you should fight the war. And Parshuram, the example that you were giving, that was in a different yuga. But now we're in Kali Yuga. And as Srila Prabhupada often quotes, Kalau Shudra Sambhavaha. So everyone is born a Shudra in Kali Yuga. So that caste hierarchy based on birth doesn't apply to this yuga anymore because people have misused their castes the first thing and there's not it's not like previous ages where a soul that comes into a certain family always has the inclinations of that family so that's the first thing that i would say the second thing that i would say is that even 
before and previous yugas, there were exceptions to the rule. Uh, like I explained the story of Jabala, he was not born into a Brahmana family, but he became a Muni. So those are the two things that I would say. And most importantly, that in Kali Yuga, no one is really born into a true Brahmana family or true Vaishya family. Everyone is born a Shudra. So the only means for upliftment is taking to Krishna consciousness. I hope that answers your question at least a little bit. Does that help, Mataji? Yes, Mataji, definitely. Jabala's example is definitely in favor of what Krishna is saying in Bhagavad Gita. And that example can be carried over. Thank you so much, Mataji. And as again, um, your class was really inspiring and the way you talked, composed and gave all beautiful points about various uh, qualities given by Rishabh Dev. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Mataji. Mataji, one question in chat. Uh, Hare Krishna, Mataji. Hare Krishna, Shall I read, Mataji? Sure, Mataji. I'll also open it. Yeah. When we meet a Brahmana, our conditional nature triggers us in judging him or her. If there are actually a Brahmana, but how can we become, become eligible to even identify or receive mercy of pure Brahmana? Thank you, Mataji. So the first part of your question is that naturally we feel like judging when we see someone or whether they're a Brahmana or not. Judging in itself is not something wrong. It's not a wrong thing to do. I think examining may be a better word because judging has a negative connotation. But Krishna or Prabhupada never tell us not to examine. Even when we're looking for a spiritual master, we don't need to blindly believe in the spiritual master, but we read the scriptures, like we read the verse today. So we see these qualities. And then we examine our spiritual masters or other people, other devotees, do they have these qualities? And not in a challenging mood or not in a mood to put them down, but just to understand things as they are. Every disciple who wants to get initiated has to go through this process of examining people, of seriously looking at people and seeing, do they, do they exhibit these qualities in their actions, in their behavior, in their day-to-day -day lives? So we get how to, we get the standards for which we need to examine people from the Shastra. That's why the Shastra is out of Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra. The Shastra is always the basis through which we operate. So we look in the Shastra to see what are the qualities that a Brahmana has. And then we look at devotees and we see, do they have those qualities? So then that's how we can identify a Brahmana, as you asked. Um, the, second per, the second question is, how do we receive the mercy of a pure Brahmana? So there's a verse in Bhagavad Gita. Tadviti pranipate na pariprasne na sevaya upadekshyanti tat. So the qualities that a spiritual master looks for is sincerity, our ability to ask genuine questions, and our mood of service to that pure Brahmana. So if we exhibit these qualities, then we'll surely get the mercy of a pure Brahmana. Thank you, Mataji. I hope that helps. Um, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Sureshwar Prabhuji, we can go we can go ahead, Prabhuji. Yeah, sure, Mataji. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Mataji, for the very wonderful class. And uh, it feels gives us so much confidence in the process. And and uh, even if there are problems, you know, it highlights how how this process will work, right? So Mataji, my question is uh, about here we 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 see that the Brahmanas or Vaishnavas are now there's no distinction, Mataji, between those two, right? That's how you know this verse is elaborating. So, Mataji, can can you highlight, you know, uh, what would be the difference between a Brahmana and a Vaishnava? Thank you, Mataji. Thank you, Prabhu. So, yes, you're correct in saying that this verse doesn't really elaborate that um, the difference between Brahmana and Vaishnava. Um, I, I recall that Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati went to a debate on this very topic on whether a Brahmana is better or a Vaishnava. Um, 
but in that context i think the caste element was still was still in play like is someone born in the caste of a brahmana better or a pure devotee like advaita charya and haridas thakur haridas thakur was not born in a brahmana family he was born in a muslim family so he was not even hindu to so to speak but advaita charya chose to consider him as the highest brahmana when he was doing the shraddha ceremony for his ancestors so in bhakti siddhanta saraswati's context i think he was still trying to dismantle this caste consciousness in people um but also one more thing that i can think of is sometimes brahmanas are attached to moksha or liberation but a vaishnava has no desire for and he doesn't even have a desire to go out of this material world he just wants to please krishna he has no desires of his own he doesn't want even emancip emancipation from this material world all he wants is to serve krishna so wherever krishna wants him to be he he's willing to be there even if it means birth after birth staying in the material world and helping other people he's willing to do that so that's one of the differences i can think of prabhu Yes, thank you very much, Mata Ji. Hare Krishna, Mata Ji. Okay. Very, very nice questions on our answer section, Mata Ji. If no one has any further questions, you can end the call here. I have a question. I mean, I have a comment. Yes, yes please. Thank you. I don't quite understand what raising the hand is, so <laughs> please forgive me. I, I, I just want to thank you so much. I got so much from your class. And if I understood correctly, you were initiated by um, Hanuman Prakash Swami Maharaj? Yes, Mataji. So I know that he tells his disciples uh, that he wants them to become pure devotees in this life. And I'm seeing this, the, uh, your association is so um, potent. And I appreciate um, that his disciples are so um, uh, incredibly uh, genuine and, and powerful. And I, I knew your spiritual master uh, very early on. He was always waking the deities every morning without fail in, in Berkeley. And uh, at one point I caught on fire when I was doing an, an RT. The charmer caught on fire and then I caught on fire from the, and he, he was the one that saved me because he took the water from uh, washing our feet outside of there and he just poured it and he, he saved me basically. And I'm seeing that his uh, disciples are gonna save so many souls in this life. So thank you so much, Mata. Thank you so much, Mataji. I'm so honored and I'm so blessed to be in your association. I hope that you would bless me. You, you're much more advanced than me and much more senior. Thank you so much for sitting here and blessing. And I'm very, very happy to know your connection with Hanumat Prashaka Maharaj. So thank you so much. Hare Krishna. I have one uh, question, Mataji. Sorry to bother. Is there any way we can uh, stay in touch with you, Mataji? Or, I mean, if you can let us do that via email or anything, that would be great. Yes, Mataji, I can put my email in the chat. I put my email in the chat in case there's any way I can serve. Write it down. So copy. Got it, Mataji. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mataji. Hare Krishna. Is there anybody else have any questions? Function, print screen. Okay. If no one have any further questions, we can end the call here. Thank you so much, Mataji, for an enlightening class today. We are very grateful to you. We look forward to your association again and again in the future. Let's pay our obeisance to Mataj and all assembled devotees. One chant and the other one. One chant and the other one. Thank you so much. Grantra Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai. Jai ki jai. Har Grace Gopi Radha Mataji ki jai. Assembled devotees ki jai. Thank you so much, Mataji. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Mataji. Dhanvat Sundaram. Wonderful class, Mataji.
Thank you. I, I, hope that, I hope that you all will bless me because I'm only made of blessings and that's my only hope. So please bless me, everyone. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, everyone. Closing the call. Thank you. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Mataji. Hare Krishna.